House of God tonight. Yes, I had some people ask me today where our church was and what time we had services and said they would want to come. So praise God. Maybe we'll have some visitors here. I'm looking for them. Uh, some of you that don't know, I got the great privilege this week of being a juror. Uh, I don't know whether it's great or not, but I believe God wanted me to do it for some reason or another because I tried getting out of it and everything I tried wouldn't let me out of it. And uh, I told Vivi, I said, uh, I went to the bathroom, don't ever go to the bathroom whenever you come out of the jury box to go <coughs> in for the derivative deliberation, don't ever go to the bathroom because whenever I come out, they said, we done chose you as head jury. <laughs> I said, will y'all follow some of the rules that I got? And they said, yes, we'll follow them. So we, I said, I want prayer before we even start. And everybody agreed to it out of 13 people. Praise the Lord. I thought that was one yes. or 12 more besides me. And then they asked me to pray again before we went out of there. And I said, I want to pray that the guy gets leniency because this guy could have spent the rest of his life in prison. And he, what he got was almost five years. But he got leniency, the least they could give him. I said, thank God. Uh, God did exactly what we asked for. Uh, you know, God puts you in positions and places sometimes that you don't want to be, but I believe it's for purpose. And I thank God for it. I thank God for an opportunity to do it. I met a lot of good people this week. Met some people I already knew, and then I met some that I'd never met before. It, uh, whenever you sit down with people and you start talking, you find out, you know, there's still some Christians out there. There's still some people that love the Lord. Thank God for that. There's still some people that uh, still care about God and His plan. Turn with me tonight to <clears throat> St. John, chapter 5. Uh, very familiar scripture, probably to all of you, but I want to talk about it one more time. But I tell you, whenever God's blessings are upon you, God's love is upon you, uh, you can take it anywhere you go. That's one good thing I like. You know what I mean? Whenever you got God with you, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, God's going to be with you. And uh, I thank God for that today. I, I felt peace in my heart, my mind, and felt the love of God. Uh, there's one more drug sell her off their streets. I like that part. I like that part. There was a time whenever Jesus, you know, Jesus had many times that he had to do things. Uh, remember the woman at the well? He said, I must go by there. There's been many times that God said, places for Jesus to go. I believe God does the same thing for you and I. I believe we go to different places because God wants us to. Yeah. And this scripture is, is a place where Jesus had to go. It was a place that he had to go by because uh, it was something that was going on there that uh, Jesus needed to deal with. And, uh, I know the people hated Jesus. They despised him. They didn't love him. They tried to They tried to say he was a wine bibber. You know, he was just no drunk and uh, he would go with the sinners and sit with those sinners and drink their wine. But we all know that that was just their way of trying to make him look bad, trying to make him look like he wasn't the person that he was, and that he wasn't God's son. And uh, they're still going back today. There's a lot of people, you know, that uh, they try to say, you know, that he was married and uh, he had a woman out of wedlock. But there's still people doing the same thing today. They, they don't love him today even. I mean, you know, there's still people that despise him. And there's still people that uh, are trying to tear him down. But I'm going to tell you something. He's still the Son of God. Yes, he and he still loves us and cares for us. And we need to uplift him and show forth his love. Because whenever he had a purpose in his life that he needed to do, he would go for that one person. Sometimes you might feel like everything in your life is going wrong. And 
nobody's there to help you, but guess what? There's still a Jesus that loves you, and he'll wrap those arms around you and tell you, I'm coming to you because I love you. And he does that for us today. It might be through an angel. He might not in physical body come down and hug you and love you, but he sends an angel down, that angel down to give you that love that you need. And here in verse 1 it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there were... There is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind halt, withered, waiting for the movement of the moving of the water. They had places to where they could go take a bath. And, uh, they would step down into these, and, and there were pools that they could take ba uh, take baths in. Uh, they didn't have showers like we have today, and uh, praise God, they had to have a place to, you know, take a bath. And uh, this uh, uh, was a place that they could go. And uh, certain times of year, God would send down an angel that would uh, stir the water. And whoever stepped in first was made whole. And I, I feel sure there was many people that laid around this, waiting on the movement of the water every day. I, I feel sure they were waiting and, and, and just... Uh, magnitude of them in them just waiting to get into that water whenever that water was stirred and that they could be made whole. Especially, you know, if you couldn't walk, uh, uh, if you couldn't move your arms. Uh, some people have back pain so bad, you know, they can't walk straight. I feel sure there was a lot of people around there like that. There's just some people, maybe some with leprosy, I don't know, but they probably wouldn't let them in the city. But there was a lot of people around there that had a lot of things wrong with them and they laid around this pool waiting on the movement of the angel that would come down and, and stir the water. <clears throat> I should have read that first before I even started talking about it. But in these days, in these lay a great multitude of different <coughs> folks, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever, when first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Uh, can, you be, can you imagine being sick with something that you can't move with for thirty eight years? Uh, can you imagine of being in a place where you probably had some have somebody to carry you and take care of you and and uh, move you around because you weren't able to do that. I know there's people in the nursing homes today that are in the same shape. And you know, whenever you walk in, your 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 love goes out to them just to think about them having to stay in that uh, wheelchair or maybe in the bed and never get out. I know whenever we used to go over to the nursing home over in uh, Thomasville, and there was a young lady there. You could tell she'd been in that. Uh, shape all of her life and she almost laid in a fetal position and uh, whenever she would lay there uh, uh, she couldn't move her legs and her arms just would barely move she could wave her arms whenever she was feeling good but uh, she was uh, just in terrible shape and uh, whenever we'd go in we'd go in pray with her and holler at her and she'd just wave and smile and uh, just have a good time in the Lord and I can imagine and I was talking to my sister-in-law the other day because she works over there and I said how's she doing and she said she has went downhill now and said uh, she's almost at the point of death that she can't hardly even move period now uh, you know whenever you look at people like that there's something that goes out of you and you just feel for them and, you know I, I feel sure that Jesus had a purpose in this because he loved everybody but there was a purpose for this one man here uh, there was a purpose because to prove to people that he is God. Uh, sometimes uh, we think, well, you know, he's got optimal power. And he can do anything. And then other times, whenever it's us sick or maybe it's our children or maybe it's somebody close to us, our faith is weak. Uh, we don't have that strong faith. Uh, we sort of waver with our faith. We're not really strong in the Lord because, you know, this is somebody that's close to us and, or either it's me and and, you know, I can pray a lot better for you than I can for myself. I can pray, you know, whenever I start praying, I can pray good for you. But if it's me, 
And I don't know how to pray for me, but I know how to pray for someone else. You know what I'm talking about? It's easier to pray for someone else than it is yourself. Because I don't believe we're meant really to pray for ourselves that much. I don't believe we're really meant to, you know, to call upon God's name that much for ourselves. Because whenever we do, what do we usually do? We start praying for everything, don't we? We start praying for stuff. We start praying, God bless my finances. God bless this. God bless that. But we never talk to God much about our health and things like that. Most times, it's what I want more than what I'm trying to say than anything else. That's the reason it's easier for me to pray for somebody else because I, I feel like I have more faith whenever I lay hands or, or, or go into a hospital room or, or go into a, a nursing home and I lay hands on people. I feel like I have more faith for them than I, than I do for myself. And, and I think God needs for it to be that way because, you know, uh, we're supposed to have that faith, and whenever we're praying for ourselves, our faith gets weak, and, and we're not that, that strong. But, you know, Jesus, he was uh, God's son. He had the ultimate faith. I mean, you know, uh, he was uh, just uh, half human. He was uh, half God, and uh, uh, he knew what he came for. He knew what the purpose was. And this man had been laying there for 38 years. I want you to get that in your mind. He, uh, not at this place, but he'd been laying somewhere for 38 years, not able to move. <sighs> Not all sin is caused, not all sickness is caused because of sin. But this sickness was because of sin. This sickness was because he had done something wrong somewhere down the line. This sickness had been brought on him because, really, in some ways, it was a punishment. I so you say, Brother Ken, we can be punished because I believe a lot of times whenever people come to church and God deals with their hearts and tries to get them to come to the altar and repent of their sins and accept Jesus as their personal Savior and they keep walking out that door and, and keep leaving and leaving, I can see it in their heart and their minds. It seems like they don't have that happiness in them anymore. And happiness, not having the happiness brings on worry. It brings on uh, troubles and tribulation and, and, and it seems like the world just falls apart because they won't surrender to God and, and I know there's a purpose in that because God's trying to get them to the altar but sometimes I wonder what will it take to get people to come and, and repent? Can't they see what's going on in their life? The first time they come in you see a smile on their face that's the reason a lot of times whenever people come in they can't come back for a while because the Spirit of God deals with them so hard that they feel like, you know, man, I just, I just don't feel like I need to go back to that church for a while. Because every time, uh, I've had people say, well, uh, after going to church and, and, and going home, I couldn't sleep. Well, you know what that is? That's God dealing with your heart, trying to get you to get saved. That's God trying to tell you that you need to be in the altar. That's God trying to tell you that you need to wake up. Now, there's sometimes you go home and you can't sleep because maybe you've done something wrong and God's dealing with you over that. And then sometimes, you know, we just don't sleep. I mean, you know, it, it, it's all in a nutshell. It rains on the just and the unjust the same. But then again, a lot of times whenever people come to church and God deals with their heart, it takes away their sleep because they're worried about where they're going to spend eternity. That's the reason you only see people come in sometimes just for a while and then they're gone. They, they are, they're short-lived because they can't handle what God's dealing with them with because they won't come to an altar. They won't repent. They won't accept Jesus. But this man was laid there because he was sick. Some words or another, he'd been hurt. He couldn't walk. Uh, he couldn't crawl. He couldn't drag himself. He was in terrible shape. And a certain man was there, which had, it, uh, had an infirmity, 38, 30, and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he would, had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man said, answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming... Because, you know, he's dragging himself or whatever he can do to get there. He's slow. He can't just jump in the water. Another step up down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I don't know why the people of the city was always worried about what day it was. 
I know why, because they wanted to condemn Jesus. If that would have been your child, if that would have been <coughs> your dad, that would have been your husband, if that would have been your wife, and Jesus touched them, and they were made whole, you wouldn't have cared what it was, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which was the Sabbath, or Sunday, which it wouldn't have mattered to you. They were made whole. Praise God, they received what they needed. But you see, people hated Jesus so bad, and they despised Jesus so bad that they were looking for something to charge him with. They wanted him dead. They wanted him killed. They didn't want him because they didn't love him. And I'm going to tell you something today. Uh, this man here, uh, I, I look at him and I think about He says, nobody's there to put me in. He got himself into that situation. Some words or another, he'd sinned, and he got himself into this situation. You say, Brother Ken, how do you know that? Because I'm reading scripture on down here, and he says, Jesus told him to go and sin no more. Uh, some words or another, he had got himself into this situation, but Jesus came by for a purpose. Just because maybe today you, you have problems in your life and Maybe it's because maybe you have done something wrong. There's not one of us in here is perfect. But, uh, if, <laughs> if you're perfect, thank God for you because we can call you Mr. Jesus or Sister Jesus because there's no perfect person. Uh, we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, the Word of God says. And sometime or another, uh, you might sin today. And, and if you do, you have an advocate with the Father. Praise God for that. And, and, and God knew we were going to need those things because he knew we were human. God has prepared things for us because he loved us. He tries to keep us in the order that we need to be. He tries to draw us. He tries to help us. He tries to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to. But sometimes there is an adversary. Y'all know him. He's the devil. And he causes us to do things wrong. And we listen to him. You say, Brother King, I ain't never done nothing like that. I ain't never listened to him. Hmm. You let somebody say something hateful to you. And boy, a lot of times you'll take it to heart. And you start talking about that person, running them down. Did you know that sin? How many of us hadn't done it? How many of us hadn't had to go back and repent? I'm your pastor and I've had to go back and repent because whenever somebody does you wrong, it hurts and, and it bites at you. And boy, you just want to fire up, you know. Our main goal is to get them back sometimes. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love. And I think the closer you get to God, the least, the least you do that. Um, and sometimes whenever things are cutting, tough, and hurting you, uh, the devil knows what place to get you to, to let things like that happen to you. So I'm not upset with this man that he had seen, because all of us could have seen. All of us could have been in the same shape. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is this. In some ways, whenever I look at this man and him there still fussing at Jesus because he's got nobody to put him in, he's still upset with God. He doesn't realize in his heart that he got himself in that situation. The reason he's laying there is because somewhere down the line he's sinned. Somewhere down the line he's done things wrong. I don't feel he still had a repenting heart until Jesus told him to pick up his bed and walk. And whenever he'd done that and that feeling's come into those legs, whenever that anointing of the Lord came upon him, there was something that came over him and he realized that he was forgiven of his sins and God had blessed him. There's people sometimes that you can deal with, you can talk to, you can love, and it's the hardest thing in the world to give them, get them to give their heart to Jesus because they're holding a grudge, they're holding things in their heart, uh, they're doing things that, uh, to try and get back at people, and it's the hardest person in the world to try and win them to Christ. And the reason is because 
they really, really don't see sometimes what they're doing. And maybe this man was in the same situation. But you see, whenever you meet the Master, whenever you meet Jesus, your life's going to change. You're not going to be the same person you were. Praise God, you're going to be a different creature. And I, I'm so thankful that God is that way. I'm so thankful that whenever we meet Jesus and we really do what God wants us to, I mean, there's been times in my life that I've had to go back and say, Lord, I wish I wouldn't have said that. And I've had to call people and apologize for what I said. There's been times that I had to go to people and apologize for what I said. There's been times that I've had to go to God and say, God, I, I, I've got to have this out of my heart, God. I'm, I'm holding this in my heart, God, and it's, it's hindering me. It, it's hindering my messages. It's hindering things. You say, Brother Ken, I, I just wouldn't tell that. Well, praise God. If I'm not going to be honest with you, I might as well throw down the Bible and go on. I'm going to tell you right now, there's times whenever every one of us have got to realize that we need God more than we need anything else. There's times in our lives that we have to call upon the name of the Lord. This man needed to realize who was standing before him. This man didn't really realize who the man was until God, until Jesus looked at him and said, pick up your bed and walk. And whenever he did, the presence of the power of God came over him and made him whole from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And praise God, he had strength in his legs and in his limbs and he was able to do it. And it says, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for, uh, lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same, said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? That he, and he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. In other words, they knew what they were after. He knew that he was after his Lord and Master now. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art whole. You, you are whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. There's nothing wrong with you. You have been made whole. You're not sick. There, there's nothing for you to turn back to. Now he says, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So in other words, if he went back and sinned, it would even be worse for him. My. It's like, and the Word of God says, it's like people come down to the altar and they give their heart to God. And they say, God, if you'll save my soul, and they'll be in a mess, you know, maybe their family's tore apart, or maybe they're on drugs, and they're asking God to come into their heart, and they're asking God to, to touch them and make them whole. And then God does that. He puts their families back together, or He puts their life back together, their own drugs. He, he helps their finances, and He blesses them. And then all of a sudden, when everything starts going good, they go back into the same old things they were in before a lot of times. And the Word of God says you'll be seven times worse. And you know, whenever you meet those people on the street, you know what you usually find with those people? They're doing things that you never thought they would do. The Word of God is true. And the Word of God is real. And it's good for you and I. And if you and I are obey it and walk in His way, you might get sick tomorrow. I'm not going to say that you sinned. Because it rains on the just and the unjust the same. But if you have sinned, Ask God to forgive you. Ask Him to forgive you of the sin first. If He forgives you of the sin, He might just see fit to heal you. But you know, I've seen people that were drunkards and they had things wrong with their liver. They would come down and pray and get saved and maybe die because their liver had been eaten up with the drinking. People on drugs. And maybe they caught different diseases because of the drugs. Get saved, but still die with that same disease. Sin has a price. And it's a price that you can't pay because it was paid at Calvary. 
whenever Jesus outstretched his arms at Calvary and went to that tomb and rose on the third day, the price for sin was paid for you and I. And we can't pay for it. You might be rich here tonight. You might say, well, Brother Ken, I could buy this or I could buy that. And that's what the world's doing today. They're trying to, they're trying their best to get a body to last forever. They're trying to take these fetuses that they're taking out of these places where people have killed them. And they're trying to grow tissue. They're trying to take parts of those fetuses and put them into people where they'll live forever. So they can defy God. Don't you believe that's what the people were doing was trying to defy God? Whenever they were looking at Jesus and he was healing them, they were trying to kill Jesus and defy God. They're doing the same thing today, just in a different way. Abortion. You're killing that child. You're killing it. You're destroying it. They say it's a choice. Sure. And Bruce was talking the other day at work. It must have been working, Bruce was talking. And I said, you know, I said, they charged that guy out in Colorado with four murders, I think. And I said, how could they do that? Because they say abortion is all right. And I said, that was a fetus. And then we got to talking and Bruce brought up and said, well, it, was her, it wasn't her choice for her fetus to die. Hmm. And then whenever you stop and stand back a few minutes and you think about it, me and him was thinking about this. Who has a choice to say, I'll take that life? None of us do. It's up to God. It's up to God. You know, sometimes... Whenever you look at this book and you see what God's got for us, there's healing for you. There's blessings for you. But we need to pray for healing for our nation, for the way people are believing in this abortion, the way they're fighting for abortion, all the things that are going on in our world. You say, Brother Ken, the world would be overpopulated. It would be too many people. What would be too many? Where would be to me? It takes one life is wrong. We need to pray. We need to see God's face on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our people. There's people that go to church. <coughs> There's people that are in churches. And I've heard of them that have abortions. How do you do that? <coughs> How do you You're murdering a person. You're murdering a child. We have a loving God that loves us and cares for us all. I want to tell you something tonight. If we've ever prayed for our nation and prayed for the people in it, we need to do it as a church. We need to stand up because nobody else is going to stand up. Nobody else cares. Nobody else cares. <coughs> We've not heard a lot of people even talk about it much anymore. You don't hear people say it is murder. You don't hear people say that it's wrong. But it is. It's time that we stand up for the nation and the people in it that are living right and let these people that want these things, let them know that we will stand for our God, our Lord, our Savior. If He created a child, and praise God, it needs to be delivered. Because that's God's love. Love it. Stand with you. I'm a little different tonight than what I planned. But you know, God always knows what we need. I love every one of you tonight. We need to be careful in the way we pray and the way we see God's face. Sometimes we listen to people, listen to the way they pray. <coughs> you know, the way they're praying is the way I need to pray. You know, I think the way we need to pray is, God, 
fill my voice with the words that you would have me to say, not what I want to say. I find myself sometimes praying, and I don't even realize what's coming out of my mouth until I start listening to myself. Because God has filled me with things to say. We need to be careful. Because there's a devil out here that's trying to steal, destroy our homes, our families, our loved ones. And church, if we've ever prayed, we need to pray for God to bless our families, bless our nation, bless us. And hold us together in these last days. We need some strength. This man needed some help. And Jesus took time out of his life to help him. The woman at the well. She needed some help. Praise God. She didn't even know it. But I feel sure every time she went into that house. And that man was there. And she wasn't mad, married to him. She felt disgusted. She felt like she was dirty. But whenever she met Jesus at the well. She went another way. And God's anointing was upon her and she won the whole city. People, we need to be winning cities. We're in the last days. One and two ain't enough. We need to win the cities. We need to win the nation. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. We need to set the woods on fire with God's anointing and God's blessings. And it takes the Holy Ghost to do that. And if we're going to pray, then we'll have to pray and ask God to pour the Holy Ghost upon us that we might speak the words that will tire people's hearts and they will see the anointing of God moving up and down their spine and know that whenever they go home, maybe they can't come back the next service, but don't let that Holy Ghost leave them. You know what I do? I say, Lord, whenever I see them going out and they're holding their head down and they can't look up, I say, Lord, just move on a little harder. Lord, don't let them go home and sleep. Keep them awake tonight. Let them stay awake. Let them lose some sleep because their soul is more important than anything else. You say you're being mean, but you know, one soul, one soul, their soul is more important to them than all this world has to offer. If you want to come to the altar tonight, the altar's open. But I'd love for us to pray. Just ask God how to hang. Dear Heavenly Father, I just love you tonight. Lord, I thank you for every blessing. God, I believe this man maybe had sinned. But God, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Word of God says. But thank God that we're serving a living God that paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And God, I just want to thank you tonight, God, and praise you, Lord. I ask God that you go with each and every person in this house tonight, God. Go through their appointed places, God. Move upon them, Lord, whenever they lay down at night, God. I pray that you keep a hedge around them, God. Give them peace. Give them love, God. God, touch their bodies, God. If they feel like they need a touch, God, I pray, God, that you just touch them and make them whole, Lord, that they can enjoy the life, God, that things around them will be good. God, we can be sick and still feel good. That doesn't matter. God, if I'm sick in body and long as I feel good, I'm not worried about it because I know one of these days this old truck's going to lay down and praise God, I'm going to go be with you. I'm not worried about the things that go wrong with it and the things that are going to happen to it. But God, I just want to be able to, to have the peace of mind and peace of heart that I can talk to the lost and win the lost at any cost. God, I'm asking you to fill our lips, our minds, our soul, God, that we'll be able to win these lost out here. God, help us to stand up for those those that are being killed through abortions, those that are being killed through the word of people's mouths, God, help us to stand up for those that they might receive the blessings of God. Help us, Lord, to be that witness that you'd have us to be. And God will give you the honor, the praise, and the glory for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Appreciate Linda singing tonight. It's always good to have Kayla and Shane with us. Thank you for coming and singing tonight. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Pray. What's the little boy's name? SJ. SJ. Pray for SJ tomorrow at 10 o'clock. He's going to be operated on. 
He's got some things that's got to be happening to him. And praise God, I want you to hold his name up at 10 o'clock tomorrow that God will be upon him. And it's going to happen. In the name of Jesus, we're going to believe it that way.